This is a, a, a fairly formal debate format. And I, I must say, you know, Mars Society uh, has committed itself and is, I think, known for having debates uh, because um, I believe very strongly we do not have enough debates in the space <coughs> program. Okay, too many decisions are made without debate, including absurd decisions. Okay, we had a decision for a space shuttle. The fact that the next, in, you know, we, we threw away all the Apollo stuff, and they had a plan to follow up Apollo, by the way, with a permanent moon base so that a human mission to Mars, out the window. Okay, we're going to have reusable space launch, space shuttles, that's much better. We're going to have a space station so there's some place for the shuttle to go to. Why? Who knows? Um, the, uh, it's going to be a zero gravity space station. Um, I once asked a NASA uh, official about that at that time. Uh, why not artificial gravity? Because when we go to Mars, it's going to be in zero gravity. Why are we going to go in zero gravity? Because all our data from the space station is going to be zero gravity. The, um, okay. Uh, and then uh, more recently, the asteroid redirect mission, which was frankly indefensible. Uh, and uh, of course, now there is a proposal for a, a lunar orbit gateway. And um, so we're going to have a, uh, a debate on that. Uh, and the proposition is, as I recall, the lunar orbit gateway is a, uh, an important next step uh, for the uh, progress of the human exploration and development of space. Uh, the, the, uh, I had actually wanted to be the key next step. Greg said, let's make it an important next step. Uh, I said, okay, I'll take that. Um, anyway, he is the affirmative, I am the negative. Okay, so he's gonna lead with 20 minute presentation of why he thinks this is a good project. I will then give 20 minutes on why I think it's a bad project. He will then have five minutes to rebut me. I will have five minutes to rebut him. And then we will open it up to questions for the floor. We anticipate at least half an hour of questions, maybe a few more if the place is lively and people want to ask some questions and have a good time. Um, so that is uh, the circumstances. And uh, so you have a few charts you've loaded into the machine. I have the presentation from this morning. I'm going to use one or two charts from it. Uh, I pointed it out to, to you where it is, okay? So without further, and Roger Gilbertson is going to moderate the debate, uh, keep us to our time limits, which must be strictly enforced. Um, and uh, you're welcome to applaud, yell, cheer. Um, don't boo, though. That's not right. Um, anyway, come on up. Yeah, I, know, I want to thank him for the uh, impartial introduction. Well, you, you, you want to take a, a couple minutes just to say? No, no, no. Okay. I'm ready to go whenever you are. All right. We're ready. And, uh, Who goes first? You do. You are the affirmative. All right. I'd like to stand if that's okay. I've been sitting a lot today. How's everybody doing? Great. Right. Thank you. I'm your host here, and I'm, I'm uh, proud to be able to support the Mars Society by uh, providing uh, some accommodations. And I know you've had to do a little bit of walking between buildings, but uh, hopefully all in a good cause. And uh, uh, although Bob and I will be uh, disagreeing here today, I think we all share the uh, same mission of a, a bright and promising uh, human future in space uh, to address uh, the many issues uh, that we have uh, facing us today, um, and uh, Bob has been a, uh, an insightful and influential leader in that regard for many years. For those of you that don't know me, um, I teach here at USC, and I run something called the Southern California Commercial Space Flight Initiative, which uh, I see some of my students out there. Hey, Julie. Brian, are you out there? Okay, so, you know, normally I would have the home field advantage here, but I think... <laughs> Bob's got the house packed, so uh, we'll, we'll see. How many of you are actually from UCLA? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. All right. Um, so uh, I do that. Uh, I teach here, and uh, I try to connect the commercial space uh, companies here with, uh, with academics, with students, and uh, with, with policymakers. 
Um, I also recently served on the presidential transition team at NASA, uh, where, and I apologize to the Mars fans, I helped set the agenda of returning to the moon. And uh, one of the first things we did, uh, and I hope, it, how many of you here are fans of the Asteroid Reader Act mission? All right, I killed that, so you can, okay, sorry. <laughs> so the one thing we agreed on, whether it was moon, Mars, robots, uh, or people, is that the asteroid redirect mission wasn't going to do anything, sadly. Um, and when you do that, now you have, you know, a big giant rocket, right? And you've got uh, a capsule that was designed to go visit a... Uh, uh, an asteroid or maybe a small bit of an asteroid that we were going to try to get and bring back until we discovered we couldn't find either the asteroid or move the small bit. And, uh, and so maybe we would just go pretend that there was, was an asteroid. That was actually a point of discussion that we would imagine that there was an asteroid and we would send a mission to it. Um, the problem being then that the capsule, which is actually somewhat capable, and you won't find me being like the defender of uh, of, of SLS Orion, but the capsule is relatively uh, capable, but it weighs twice the size of the Apollo uh, capsule. Does anybody know why? Intentionally. Well, okay, see, so Dennis can hit, but we do have to admit that, that for some reason it has to have twice as many people in it, right? And it is for a longer duration mission. So the fact it weighs more is not probably surprising, but then it's also underpowered, right? Because the exploration uh, uh, upper stage doesn't exist, so we don't have a second stage. And the service module developed by the Europeans doesn't have enough power. And people will tell you that the service module engine on, on the Orion was in fact the same engine that was on uh, the Apollo, and that's not true. What it is is a, an orbiter uh, thruster engine from the space shuttle, which was derived from the same rocket design that was used on, on the Apollo, but it's actually like one-fourth the thrust. So you've got a capsule twice as much, one-fourth the thrust, you don't have an upper stage. And the bottom line is you can't go to the surface of the moon, right? So this is the situation that you deal with when you arrive in D.C. in 2016 and somebody says, you group of people go figure out what NASA should do with this, right? Okay, so I was there. Um, we disagreed about a lot of things. We do believe, though, that we are in a geopolitical uh, competition with other countries, notably China, who wish to go to the moon and essentially, although the Outer Space Treaty bans it, claim territory in ways that will exclude U.S. activities there in the future that are very important. So we believe it's consequentially interesting and important that we get to the surface of the moon. There are certainly multiple ways to do that. And you're probably going to be surprised to find out <clears throat> that I completely agree with Bob and hate his vision of the gateway, right? If the purpose of the gateway is to fund SLS flights, if the purpose of the gateway is to serve as a toll booth that you have to go to before you go to the surface of the moon, that is not something that I approve of. So I'm going to talk about a very different gateway, and this was the deep space habitat that was the original plan uh, for uh, what is now gateway. And, and Gerstenmeier came to us and said, well, here's something you could do, right? We could go visit this thing. We'll create a, a, a space station in space. It's like a mini ISS uh, in deep space. And people will say, oh, well, you're just creating a place for SLS to go. And maybe you are, right? And we've been here before. When were we here before? Well, we were here before back when, and by the way, that there's the view you'd have from, from that vehicle. Isn't that nice? And that was inspiring to a whole generation of people. That, that created the environmental movement in 1968. Uh, pardon me. My slides are out of order. Hi, Bob. <laughs> All right, so here we were. We needed a place for the space shuttle to go because the space shuttle actually didn't really have much of a purpose, right? We spent billions of dollars making it. What does it do? It was supposed to deliver cargo and people to orbit for an incredibly low price at a very high cadence and high reliability. And it was neither reliable nor high cadence nor, nor low price, so we built a space station, right? Now, how many of you would build a space station like that um, from a practical standpoint? Okay. I would build a space station like that, but not from a practical standpoint, because it hasn't really delivered a lot of practical value. And it's very expensive. It costs $130 billion. We call it the International Space Station, but does anybody know how much the international partners paid of the $130 billion? Well, yeah, something like that. Less than 30. So we paid over 100. Now, it costs $3.5 
billion dollars a year, and I spent a lot of time digging through the NASA books to support that thing. How much do the international partners pay of the annual three and a half billion dollar maintenance? Nothing, okay? We pretend that they do, but what we really did was let them design the underpowered module um, for the Orion capsule and waived all their ISS fees. So they never actually paid anything other than to develop the service module for, uh, for Orion. But the space station is wonderful because without the space station, ah, you wouldn't have that, okay? The reason that eight miles south of here in Hawthorne, California, you have a booming commercial space company that is changing everything in the dynamics of space and making it possible for us one day to actually go to Mars and do what we want to do and to deliver decent payloads uh, uh, to lunar orbit is because we funded the space station and a company was able to build a rocket and a capsule with a reason to go there. Thankfully, the space shuttle uh, became untenable. Uh, if it hadn't, who knows, but it was obvious after Columbia we had to do something, so we got COTS, one of the best programs that NASA ever developed. And the, uh, thank you. And executed, NASA actually executed it well under other transactional authority, which they should have done with Commercial Crew, the new follow-on program, which I'm very, very hopeful will in fact fly next year. I was hoping it would fly this year. The reason it didn't fly is half due to Senator Shelby of, uh, of Alabama. I hope nobody's recording this. Uh, uh, cutting the budget and, and throwing it to us. Also, it's also half due to the fact that they didn't really do it under OTA and that it got messed up in this whole FAR paperwork thing that is a nightmare. And frankly, the vendors haven't always done everything they should to, to be on the ball. But nonetheless, it's going to happen. We're going to have two commercial space capsule systems and uh, launch rockets that are human rated. Why is it important to have two? Because redundancy, and this is a really, really important point I want to make about Gateway. If you have only one system, no matter how good that system is from an engineering standpoint, to get to a location where human beings are living for any amount of time, you are in huge jeopardy. What happened when the shuttle failed in the Challenger accident? The whole program was down for three years while committees pointed fingers at each other, recrimination and congressional investigation. What happened in, after Columbia? We were down for another three years. We can't afford that. We must have more than one way to get to the surface of the moon. And I absolutely support Bob's Moon Direct program. And I have no problem with going directly to the surface of the moon. But I also support Gateway because guess what? Why does this? SLS is never going to fly, okay? All right. So if SLS doesn't fly, but you have Gateway, you have a brilliant commercial system. In fact, the contracts have already been put out for the first two modules. Does anybody know what the PPE module cost? Fixed cost price, $375 million. That is a drop in the bucket in, uh, in the federal budget, $375 million. And the HAB module isn't much more than that. And it is a Cygnus, it is a, a Cygnus capsule from a commercial manufacturer. None of this money went to, to Boeing or, or, or Lockheed uh, that had been developed for the COTS program. And they're thinking scrappy. They're thinking smart. They're getting it done cheap. And both of the launch contracts are going to be on commercial heavy launch vehicles. It's important that commercial heavy launch vehicles have customers so that they can develop the capabilities they need to work in uh, cislunar space to deliver payloads to the moon. It's important that they be able to do that so that we can human rate these vehicles after they've made a dozen flights or so. It's important that the money continue to flow into SpaceX so that they can continue to develop uh, Starship, it's important that other vendors have the opportunity to participate in that market and that we have redundant systems to get ourselves to the moon. And Gateway, surprisingly, can serve these purposes for a relatively very low amount of money. Now, let me see if I can go backwards here. All right. So here's the NASA budget over time. And one thing I'm really proud to point out was that when my team arrived, it was right there, okay? It is just barely starting to inflict up. This is the NASA budget is a percentage of federal, uh, federal spending over time. It was in a, a dust pile, and I remember sitting with the team and other people who had been NASA veterans for years and arguing over what we needed to cancel, 
and play the zero sum game, all right? We're gonna have to kill this and this so that we can do that and well, they wanna move money into SLS, of course, right? And I'm like, why don't we just go ask for more money? You can't do that, you can't ask for more. No, let's, let's just go ask for more money. No, you can't do that. See the line, it goes down all the time, right? The budget is fixed at $18 billion until the end of fucking time, pardon me, and, and we're just going to let it get eaten apart by inflation. I'm like, no, let's, let, let's go ask for more money, right? And all I can say is, the president, whether you like him or not, he likes big, shiny, th exciting things, and he likes space, and the vice president is big on, on space and public partner, private partnerships, and we got more money. The Congress, bless their hearts, has supported it, and in fact, we've moved from 18-something billion dollars to 23.75 in the latest uh, Senate appropriations. He's been the only significant increases in, in a very, very, very long time. So that is good. We don't have to play the zero-sum game where we get only this choice or that choice. We can have a gateway. We can spend $375 million on a, a PPE module. We can put the HAB module up there. We can pay for a half dozen commercial launches to uh, send it up there. Then we're going to have to resupply it. And guess what? If SLS and Orion isn't uh, ready to go, they're going to have to to populate it somehow, and we'll find another commercial program to do that. So that is my support, which I think you'll probably find surprising uh, for Gateway. And the key thing I want to point out is this, that in any solution you want, you've got an engineering possibility. These are the things that, that can be done engineering-wise. And as close to the center, that might be where you want to be with the perfect engineering solution. And I think Bob is going to take you to the perfect engineering solution. He's going to explain why it's perfect from an engineering standpoint. Then you got the things that you can afford and you can do economically, and there's some overlap in that, that Venn diagram, and you want to be you know, as close to the center of that as possible. And then there are the things you can do politically. And whether you like it or not, if you go and you try to kill off the program of record and stop Artemis and start over with the, the Moon Direct program instead of doing it in parallel, you're going to create the antibodies from Alabama and elsewhere, and they're going to come out and they are going to shut down human spaceflight forever. I would not be surprised to see the next president come in and simply kill human spaceflight forever because the space community is too busy having these debates and arguing with each other over the zero-sum game. They don't like fighting. And did anybody read Lori Garver's uh, kind of scary editorial a few months ago? Yeah, what did she say, Dennis? Yeah, okay, and so that's a good selling point, and that's easier, and you don't have to listen to Bob and I fight, and the SLS Californian uh, Alabama fight, and uh, and just kill off uh, uh, EO. So we'll see what happens there, but this is my concern, that we need to not play the zero-sum game, we need to not oppose each other, we need to support multiple solutions for getting to the surface of the moon, and we need redundant systems so that when people are there, that we have options to transport them. And we can talk more about that, but I'm going to, at this point, yield my time to Bob. Thank you. I thought Can you just you sabotaged advance, it for advance, me. Advance the chart, please. <laughs> I see, I thought he there sabotaged it. There we go. It. Point this way. Point with the... Okay. That will do. Okay. Will there be a test on this? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we'll get to you talking about this in a minute. Oh. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> The historian Howard McCurdy tells a story about a meeting that occurred at the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center around 1963. I may have some of the details of this wrong, but you'll get the big picture. Okay, and at, at this time, 
the lunar orbit rendezvous plan that had been put forth by Johnny Hubble uh, was no longer considered wacky. It had a substantial faction of support, but it had not yet prevailed. There were three other major factions in arguing of how we could get to the moon. There were the space station people. Before we go to the moon, we must build a space station. It's the only way to go to the moon. There were the nuclear rocket people. Before we go to the moon, we must have nuclear thermal rockets. It's the only way to do it. And there were the uh, Saturn IX people. The Saturn V is not good enough. We must have a Saturn IX. That's the only way to do the job. And so they're having this big food fight at Marshall. And then finally somebody said, look, do we really want to go to the moon or don't we? And there was 30 seconds of dead silence in the room. And then they all looked around and said, it's got to be LOR. That's the only way to do it. And it, you, know, you had all these other people there saying, you can't do your program until you do my program. But the imperative of actually getting to the moon by 1969, which was taken seriously as a real geopolitical imperative, won the day and it forced the baloney out of the system. Okay. Now, 1989, President George Bush, the first, gets up on the stairs of the Air and Space Museum on the 20th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing and says, this is the 20th anniversary of the moon landing. That was great. That's what America's all about. And therefore, I, as president, am committing us to go back to the moon and on to Mars and this time to stay. It was great stuff, right? And then NASA goes off and conducts a study on how this might be accomplished. But NASA at this time was interested in selling the space station, the International Space Station. And so they insisted as a baseline for going to the moon that it must use the space station. That is, the moon missions must be assembled on orbit at the International Space Station. And so you had to have a space station, in fact, a much bigger space station than the one we have with do hangars and everything and orbital repair shops and all this stuff. And you would do a moon mission by assembling it on order with three shuttle sea launches and one regular shuttle launch. And it was so complicated that it really just couldn't be done. And, you know, in 1989, there were still plenty of Apollo veterans in NASA, people who had actually sent people to the moon. And they looked at this and they said, look, if we could put a man on the moon, why can't we put a man on the moon? And the answer is because you had other people telling them, you can't do your program until you do my program. Okay. And now, it is not true that SLS and Orion were designed to do the asteroid redirect mission. The asteroid redirect mission was designed to give SLS and Orion something to do because they hadn't figured that part out. Now, the, 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 uh, they were remains of the Griffin moon program. Okay, Orion was designed much too big. It's 26 tons compared to the 9-ton Apollo capsule okay, or the 10-ton Dragon. And we can get back to that point in a minute. Uh, the... the, the uh, so they came up with this ridiculous asteroid redirect mission to give it something to do. And then, yes, just as Greg said, when they found out they couldn't do that, they said, can we imagine that there's an asteroid there and visit it? Um, and then they said, well, that's just too idiotic. We'll put a space station there, and that will give it something to do. Now, this space station has no utility. Okay, it does not make moon missions easier. It adds to the delta V requirement. It adds to the timing requirements. Okay, it's, uh, it costs money to build. It costs money to operate. Okay, the analogy I give is, is here's the deal. Okay, imagine someone comes up to you and offers to, uh, to rent you a hotel in Saskatoon, Canada. Okay, now it, here's, here's the proposition. You need to pay to build the hotel. You will need to pay $100,000 a month rent forever. There is no out clause. Okay. Uh, you will need to spend a month every year in Saskatoon. And from now on, whenever you want to fly anywhere, you must fly through Saskatoon. Okay. You're better off not having this asset, okay. even if it was given to you for free. And it's not free. Okay. It makes things worse. Now. And, and believe me, if they build this gateway, they will force people to use it because they cannot afford to have people look at it and say, you didn't really need that, did you? Okay. Just like the Bush uh, International Space Station, they said, you must use, the space station is necessary to go to the moon or Mars, even though it wasn't the last time. 
Okay? And in fact, right now we have a space station and no one is talking about using it to go to the moon, okay? even though we actually have it. Okay? And, uh, because they're not trying to sell it. It's there. Why bother using it? Okay? Now, this here is the mission architecture that has been published for how to do a moon mission using the gateway. Okay? It requires four launches for every mission. It requires five flight elements. It requires six rendezvous for each mission. That compares to Apollo, which was one launch, one rendezvous, three flight elements. Okay? So people say Apollo wasn't a sustainable way to go to the moon. Apollo was a far more sustainable way to go to the moon than what is being currently proposed. This is absurd. Okay, now, okay, so you have, uh, I mean, I like Bridenstine. I think he's a great guy, but he is approaching this as a politician, not as an engineer. And listen, there, you can talk about political necessity, but if you have a space project, the number one requirement is mission success. You can't put that one aside, okay? And multiplying all these dependencies, 15 different things in this mission, which if any one of them goes wrong, you lose the whole mission. This is totally absurd. It is completely irresponsible. Now, you have here, okay, he's got the pressure from Shelby et al. I want you to use the SLS. So he says, fine, I'll use the SLS. You have pressure from the new space people. We want you to use the new space stuff. He says, fine, I'll use that too. So instead of the uh, new space stuff cheapening the mission, it just adds to the cost. And not only that, in, in order to make, you know, it, this is like adding extra parts to Macbeth so to give every kid in the class a part in the school play. Okay. That's what it is. And that's fine for the school play. But this is not how you want to do a space mission. You want to make it as simple as possible. Now, if every time you go to the moon, you have to have four launches, six rendezvous, all this stuff each and every time, you're not going to the moon very often. So if you're a lunar advocate, you must hate this. Okay? Now, this is an absurd architecture. The, 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 and, okay, now, and you're spending the money on building a gateway that you don't need instead of on a lunar lander, which is absolutely necessary if you want to land on the moon. You, you do need a lander. Okay, now, the, the, so the, this is crazy. Now, here's the thing. I start reading online. Moon advocates blaming this on the Mars people. <laughs> okay, Ketol Vinavat, who is to blame? Okay, the eternal question, we are to blame for this. Okay, okay, because now, it is true that NASA has come up with a Mars plan that needs to use the gateway. Okay? They have a thing that they call the deep space transport. It uses electric propulsion and it departs from the gateway and it goes to Mars and it can get there in 300 days. Franklin Chang D has tried to sell electric propulsion. He did succeed in selling it by claiming it could get you to the Mars in 39 days. Well, there are people at NASA that can do math, and they did the calculus. They said, no, it's 300 days, assuming you leave from the gateway, which is a near escape condition. Okay, it would be 600 days if you left from Leo. Now, we can get to Mars right now with chemical propulsion from Leo in 200 days or less. We did it last year with InSight. We did it in 2003 with Spirit and Opportunity. We did it in 210 days in 1996-97 with Pathfinder. Okay, so we need an orbital base in order to be able to get to Mars in 300 days by using electric propulsion instead of using electric propulsion to get there in 600 days from LEO when not using electric propulsion, we could get there in 200 days right now. Okay, so this makes absolutely no sense. And, and I, there is a, this is what's called a bat chart because the bats are hanging from the ceiling and they have a bat chart for Mars, man, and it, um, it's crazy. Now, furthermore, basing the deep space, tra deep space transport uses xenon propellant. Okay, pop quiz, is there xenon on the moon? Okay, uh, okay, no, there is not. Okay, now, so 
All the talk about using lunar resources to support Mars exploration is completely out the window since they have baseline to form a propulsion that doesn't use oxygen, which you could conceivably get from the moon. Okay? Now, Bridenstein says, um, as soon as we discovered water on the south pole of the moon, we should have made our objective the moon. Well, then why don't you make your objective the moon instead of lunar orbit? If you want to use the water, the water is on the moon. Lockheed Martin comes along, and they proposed, it was at the IAC last year in Bremen, okay, a lunar lander that uses hydrogen-oxygen propulsion. It's based at the gateway. It needs 40 tons of hydrogen-oxygen propellant shipped there from uh, Earth. It will land on the moon, and it can retrieve two tons of water and bring it back to the gateway where it will be electrolyzed and turned into propellant. So you get to spend 40 tons of propellant in order to retrieve two tons of propellant. Okay. This is, and now they even say, well, we want to have a Mars orbit gateway too before we go to Mars, okay? which is absurd. And they came up with a lander there, which goes to the surface of Mars, gets water, brings it back to their, uh, what's called, the base camp, it's called, and then it will make propellant. But it takes more propellant to fly up from the surface of Mars to their uh, base camp than the amount of propellant you can make with the water you achieve from the surface of Mars. There's a basic concept in, uh, to understand with respect to space resource utilization, which is you use it where you make it, or as close to there as you can. Making propellant on the surface of the moon to use to take off from the moon is a sure winner. Okay. Using propellant from Earth to go to the surface of the moon to bring water back to orbit to make into propellant is a sure loser, and it's even worse for Mars. Okay. Now, why are they doing this? Why are they doing the gateway? Why did they propose the asteroid redirect mission? Why was the shuttle flown 125 or 30, whatever, times? I can think of five shuttle missions that are strongly justified, those to launch, repair, upgrade the Hubble, a few others, okay. The others were just done it, it, it literally in order to do it, okay. That is, they're doing things in order to spend money. And that's the fundamental problem here. The fundamental problem is the mode of thinking. There is two modes that NASA has operated in. There's a purpose-driven mode and a vendor-driven mode. In a purpose-driven mode, which Apollo was, although the purpose was geopolitical, not scientific, but nevertheless, it was a clear purpose. Okay, we want to do this. We're going to put people on the moon by the end of this decade to astound the world with what free people can do. And they did it. And they weren't looking for extra things to do. They weren't looking, you know, when people proposed extra things, they pushed them out of the way. And does anyone here imagine for a minute that they could have gotten to the moon faster in the 1960s if they had built a lunar orbiting gateway, you know, uh, as, uh, before they, I mean, it'd be absurd, okay? The, the, okay, no, and Apollo was purpose-driven. The science program then and now remains purpose-driven. And that is why the science program of NASA, the space telescopes, the rovers on Mars, Cassini, etc., this has accomplished epic things. The accomplishments of the science program remains epic. The accomplishments of the human spaceflight program, except for Hubble, in the, the past uh, 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 45 years have been negligible, absolutely negligible. And uh, it, 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 it's crazy. You, so you don't have a purpose-driven program. You have a vendor-driven program in which you don't spend money to do things. You do things in order to spend money. Now, Greg showed some statistics, which I think are accurate, of how NASA's percentage of the federal budget has, has gone down. But you want to know something? In absolute inflation-adjusted dollars, NASA's budget over the past... Uh, 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 um, the, the 20 years was more than the past, first 20 years. What? Okay, oh, five minutes left. That's right. In absolute inflation-adjusted dollars, NASA's budget from 1958 to 1978 was $350 billion. That's in current money. NASA's budget over uh, the period from uh, uh, 
1998 to 2018, 400 billion dollars. We actually spent more money at NASA between 1998 and 2018 than we did between 1958 and 1978. And between 1958 and 1978, we not only did Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, and Skylab, we developed the entire raft of technologies that are used to enable spaceflight pretty much. Hydrogen, oxygen engines, multi-stage heavy lift launch vehicles, in-space life support, space suits, uh, space rendezvous techniques, space navigation techniques, deep space communication techniques, lunar landing techniques, re-entry technology, uh, all this stuff. We built the whole infrastructure, the deep space network, Kennedy Space Center, Johnson Space Center, all this stuff. The, the, we did it all. And we also did 40 lunar and planetary missions okay, as well. Okay, with actually slightly less money than we spent over the past 20 years. Why? Because those were purpose-driven expenditures. And this is the fundamental program. This is corruption. Okay, there actually is in this architecture a, uh, a, a special vehicle that moves the lunar lander from the gateway down to low lunar orbit, okay, and then it goes back to the gateway, and then the lander goes the rest of the way to the surface of the moon, and then the ascent vehicle comes back up to the gateway. The, the, why is that in there? Why? It's an extra vehicle. It's an extra contract, okay? And it's an extra rendezvous. The, this is, what can I say? It's irresponsible. This will not get us to moon by 2024. This is the primary obstacle to getting us to the moon by 2024. Okay, now, next chart. All right, now, I propose this architecture known as Moon Direct, okay, you know, because, which uh, I'll just rehearse it. Uh, you land a couple of HAB modules directly on the moon. I'm proposing here Falcon Heavy. You could use SLS for this. I'm actually not against SLS if you need it. SLS is a capability as opposed to the gateway, which is a liability, okay? The, uh, I would want to use it as little as possible, okay? But until Starship is flying, SLS is the heaviest throw you have. But Falcon Heavy can do 60 tons to low Earth orbit. That means 10 tons to the surface of the moon. So you land a couple of HAB modules on the surface of the moon. SLS with the proper upper stage could land 15 tons on the surface of the moon. So First couple of launches, we put a couple of HABs near the south pole of the moon where we want to have the moon base. So now you've got some houses pre waiting for you on the surface of the moon. If you can land 10 t we need then a, a lightweight lunar lander comparable to the Apollo LEM. Apollo LEM upper stage, including the cabin with its life support and 1,000 pounds of avionics with much less capability than your phone, weighed two tons, 1960s materials. I propose that we make a similar vehicle made with modern materials, modern avionics, also two tons, but with a hydrogen oxygen stage capable of six kilometers a second delta V. Six, oh, okay, I don't have enough time to go through it. But suffice to say, this makes use of lunar resources instead of avoiding their use. This gives you a sustainable architecture. And here's the thing, if you have to use SLS for the first couple of launches before you have lunar propellants available for you, okay, fine, but then you free them up. Okay, you don't do an architecture which keeps your heaviest lift capability tied up. The, the, the idea of a lunar base, if you want it to be sustainable, it should require the least launch as possible, so we free our heavy lift capability and our money and our development efforts to support going further. If you do moon efficiently, we can also go to Mars. If we create, on the other hand, an artificial quagmire, um, frankly, we don't even get a lunar capability and we never go to Mars. And that's why I'm against the gateway or toll booth as it should be called. Am I ready? You're ready when you are. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, Bob's really concerned about saving your federal dollars, and, and, and I appreciate that. I understand uh, he is a parsimonious gentleman. Um, but, you know, where do you save your federal dollars? The NASA budget, as I mentioned, is, uh, when I came in, 0.42% of federal spending. Bob's uh, uh, 
uh, estimate of the NASA budget for the first 20 years is kind of misleading because basically NASA did nothing between 1958 and 61 of, of great significance. They were transitioning from being NACA. There was very little spending. Then they spent a huge amount of money between 61 and 73 when we actually ran the Apollo program. If you took like the 66 budget um, and, and adjusted it for inflation, you'd probably be spending $120 billion a year instead of $20 billion a year. It was almost 5% of the entire federal budget at the time. And then after 73, we weren't doing much <clears throat> again until we started building the shuttle in the, in the late 70s. So those were times when Nixon had cut the budget at NASA quite a bit. So it's a little bit misleading to look at the 20-year periods because he's, he's just kind of encapsulating the Apollo in two periods where not much happened. Um, also, though, when you think about the, the approximately 20-something billion dollars we're spending at NASA, what does that mean in the federal budget? The cost overrun, the just cost overrun on the F-35 project is $160 billion. It is eight times the entire NASA budget. This is where we should be looking for problems. Instead of arguing over whether this NASA program or that NASA program isn't the most absolutely economic or engineering efficient solution that you could come up with, and again, fighting with each other in a way that just frankly pisses off people in Congress and in the White House. Medicare and Medicaid fraud in the United States, according to the RAND Corporation, is $98 billion a year, five times the NASA budget. Again, so. We're trying to make our little portion of the federal budget perfect while the rest of the thing runs wild. And I don't buy that. What I do buy is, if we could go back to uh, uh, Bob's previous slide, I'd, I'd love to hit, use his, uh, there we go, okay. Commercial launch, commercial launch, commercial launch, developing the capabilities we need to put things into this lunar space using a variety of commercial vehicles, developing the operational capability to operate as a blue water navy, essentially, by being able to do things farther away than three hours from home. This causes you to plan and execute in an entirely different way. And anybody that's run a literal Navy versus a blue water Navy knows the difference for this. It requires that we have supply systems and that we have alternative and redundant ways to get those people back home and get people to and from the, the lunar surface. We should absolutely run the program that Bob proposes in his next slide, and we should also absolutely build the gateway because it's an interesting and useful piece of architecture and infrastructure and space we should be putting power towers on the lunar surface near the South Pole that act as communications and navigation systems, which has been proposed by Dr. Allison Zwenga here from uh, NASA Ames. We should be doing all these things and building a complex and sophisticated infrastructure that we're capable of using and that, that has redundancy and will help us learn what we need to do to live in deep space for a while. Now, whether electric propulsion takes 200 days or 300 days is, is certainly a concern if, if you're on the ride. But if you're simply sending cargo and uh, uh, perhaps a gateway to Mars, I don't care whether it takes 300 days or, or 200 days, it is interesting to send a gateway to Mars. The great thing about the gateway is it can move. I can take it out of the orbit that is artificially created in order to allow Orion to uh, dock with it with its underpowered service module. And, and Bob is right. Orion and SLS weren't designed for asteroid redirect mission. Asteroid redirect mission was fabricated because you had this vehicle, but the service module is weak because it only needed to support asteroid redirect. So we could do better than that. The gateway can move. It can go to other Earth orbits and back, and you could send a gateway to Mars. You could do a landing and uh, sample return on Phobos, for instance, without developing a Mars ascent vehicle and without proving ISRU, which is just fundamental to Bob's concept that we haven't tested. Please, let's develop an entirely robotic probe that goes to the tundra somewhere in, in Saskatchewan, where, which is more like Mars than any place on Earth, so I don't want a condo there. But anyway, uh, let, let's send a robotic probe up there to, to do some ISRU all on its own with no human beings helping it and develop some fuel and fly back. When you can do that, then I'm excited. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, just uh, first of all, to correct a matter of fact, um, you take the NASA budget from 1961 through 1973, not counting the 50s, from Kennedy's speech through the Skylab program, because Skylab was really part of Apollo, uh, and you add up all that money 
and put it in today's dollars, it comes out to $22 billion a year. That is NASA's budget this year. Okay. So it is simply not true that NASA's budget in the Apollo period was vastly more than it is now. It was a much higher percentage of the federal budget because the federal budget was much smaller. The United States had one quarter the gross national product in the 1960s than it has now. And the federal budget had much less um, uh, programs, uh, uh, um, whatever they're called, uh, non-discretionary, uh, uh, yeah, right, as well as discretionary. Okay, it was just much less bloated. And uh, so the country was poorer. It had a smaller federal budget, okay, uh, and yet we did Apollo, okay, and we did it before we had, well, we did, we started it before we had push-button telephones, and certainly uh, uh, it was more or less completed before we had pocket calculators that were affordable enough for any engineer to want to use, okay. Uh, and, okay, so there is that. The, um, now, Greg says that this is great because you're giving business to commercial launchers. I say that is the wrong way to think about it. We don't do a space program in order to give business to people. Okay? We give p business to people in order to accomplish a space program. The reason to implement ISRU as early as possible in both the moon and Mars uh, missions is to minimize the number of launches. If you minimize the number of launches required to do each lunar mission, it means you get to go to the moon more. In other words, are we going to the moon in order to develop the moon? Okay, in those, is it a legitimate objective, in which case it should be done as efficiently as possible? It is not a question of saving money from the federal budget. I mean, you know, that's hopeless, right? And, and, and in any case, I mean, you know, the, Mexico's paying for it all anyway. But the, uh, okay, um, it is a, a question of we have a space program, we want it to accomplish as much as possible. This is our space program, okay? And we're paying for it, we're paying 22 billion a year. I'm willing to pay 22 billion a year. But, and half of it's going to the manned the human space flight program. I want that program to be accomplishing things. I want a human space flight program that's really going places. I want a human space flight program that is, yes, really developing the moon and Mars. Okay, so we don't come up with plans that waste as much money as possible, that have as much mission risk in them as possible, that are, I mean, in other words, you have to coordinate four launches here in order to get one crew to the moon surface. How often are you going to do that? Okay, this, this is a, 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 a program for irreg of extremely irregular presence on the moon, uh, not a program that can develop the moon. So if, you know, we're going to the moon because the moon has water and we're going to make use of it, then do that. And, and then if you do that, if you uh, develop those lunar resources as rapidly as possible by building your base on the moon. You can minimize the number of launches required so you can go to the moon repeatedly. You do a lot of stuff on the moon. Same with Mars. Okay? But we have to uh, avoid this trap of doing projects in order to give vendors money. You can't run your business by running it in order to give your vendors money. I have a business. I've been in business 23 years. I do not let my vendors tell me what my purchases should be. Okay, I figure out what my purchase should be, and then I give the vendors the bunch, well, as little business as I can, but as, as, a, as much business as I must. Okay, and that's how we need to run the space program. Thank you. I don't know if this works. Oh. All right. One, the underpowered service module was because the LSAM under Constellation was going to do the lunar orbit insertion burn. Five years of no budget for the federal government kept the requirement 
for the underpowered stage. ARM was ARM. The gateway is supposed to enable lunar uh, global access. According to the human landing system procurement documents, it only provides 28% access to the lunar surface. Um, there's a plethora of other requirements. Uh, the abort requirements from the surface uh, inadequate to support human safety. Um, with the exploration upper stage, which NASA is already trying to budget to build, integrating the vehicle, uh, integrated vehicle fluids of, from ULA, they can get Orion into lunar orbit. So if we can get to the moon, we want to get to the moon. Why do we want to spend an extra $3 billion, which is what is currently in the overall budget, for the gateway? Why do we want to spend that rather than spending it getting to the surface? You. I will presume that that question One minute is limits to on directed answer. to me from my friend Dennis. Thank you. Um, I don't understand your question about 20% access to the lunar surface or your statement. Okay. You can modify the orbit. Of course, it depends on the lander and in the time frames that you're willing to accept, but you can get to anywhere on the moon using the, the gateway PPE. Okay. According to the actual design for the PPE for Maxar, you can. Uh, we can uh, discuss that more. I don't have the data in front of me, but that is absolutely a possible. You may not get there when you want to get there, though, and your point is really well made about uh, crew uh, retrieval from the surface and the NHRO orbit uh, taking approximately a week, which is why we need redundant systems, and I fully support direct to and from the surface as well as this infrastructure capability. As far as the, the $3 billion, it's not, again, very significant either within the NASA budget or within uh, the total federal budget. The recurring cost will be very low if you use commercial support and not SLS. So I certainly do not support the gateway vision that involves a bunch of SLS flights, either to put it up there or, or to crew it or support it. I support it as a useful piece of space habitat for us to learn about how to exist in, and Bob doesn't like it, zero-G environments, and to live in, in deep space so we can begin to investigate other possibilities for, for human habitation or, or long-term transportation. And I agree with you absolutely, Bob. At some point, we need to look at artificial gravity as well. Uh, I agree with you that we need a more powerful upper stage. I'd love to see a, a ULA ACES Plus sort of design. Uh, I think it would be a bad idea to simply give more money to the current vendors to develop a, a, an upper stage when they can't finish the first stage, but uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, a couple things. Um, if you're doing a lunar base, you do not want to do lunar orbit rendezvous as the basis of the architecture. and. Uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous was fine for Apollo. They were brief stays on the lunar surface, and it saves mass to stage your return propellant in lunar orbit. However, if you have the capability of making propellant on the surface of the moon, okay, it does not save mass to bring propellant from Earth and stage it in lunar orbit. It is actually lower mass to come back direct from the surface of the moon using propellant made on the surface of the moon. But not only that, look, if you're, it's one thing to play Mike Collins when people are down on the surface of the moon for a day and you're waiting for them to come back. It's another thing if they're going to be there for a month or three months at a time. Okay, that's r ridiculous. And the, the, the uh, but furthermore, lunar orbit rendezvous instills a mission critical element into the, the, the mission. If you miss the rendezvous, you miss the boat. Okay, the, if you come back from the, if, viewed from the surface of the moon, the Earth is always in the exact same place in the sky. Your launch window to Earth is always open. So it's far safer to be able to come back from the surface of the moon using lunar propellant without dependence on a rendezvous, without dependence on an orbital asset, whether it's a LEM or a gateway, okay, to just come back, and you can come back any time. So that's the cheaper way to do it. It avoids an extra spacecraft. It enjoys a, uh, avoids a whole space station, and it's it's the safest way to do it. Okay. So that was one one minute.
like to respond? Wait, wait a second. We each did a minute to, in answer to one question. I don't so, think so that's, that's how it goes. We should ask another question. My argument was that that talk about Lunar Orbit Rendezvous wasn't the question. He, I, you had a minute. Yep. I had a minute. Have ask a minute. another question. Okay, You'll have so more we've minutes. Got two microphones. We'll go one question on this side, Robert one on that side, back and forth. Next question. All right. Okay, so and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of did say that you could you could theoretically do both of these programs. You could build the gateway. You could go to the moon using. My question, kind of, to Bob's argument about like, oh, you know, about the argument that. Um, I can hear him. Yeah, but the recorder can't. For the webcast. Is that what Just that? shout. I can hear you. So what I was saying is that you had kind of indicated that you could do both programs. You could build this gateway, you could go to the moon using the moon direct program, but Bob's argument is kind of that building this is a way to subvert the idea of going to the moon and that like if you just want to go to the moon, just go to the moon. So what do you think about the architecture of flipping this? Just do the moon direct program and then just build this to not go to the moon. It's a great vehicle, but not great for going to the moon. So, uh, I believe that if you're going to do sustainable occupation of a territory, you have to have multiple transportation systems to get to and from there. That's absolutely required. That is the mandate under the President's Space Policy Directives. And so, I believe we have to have multiple ways to do this. I would like to see Bob's program developed as a commercial program funded under a uh, OTA authority from not NASA, perhaps. Perhaps uh, it could come out of DOD, or perhaps as a prize competition coming out of uh, Department of Commerce or something, so NASA doesn't F it up. Uh, if you canceled the program that NASA is doing now, after we canceled the last program that they were doing, ARM, after the Obama administration canceled the Constellation program, I swear to God, the next president's going to come in and say, space is about earth sciences and screw human exploration and just kill it. And I think you're really, really got the champion there to kill human space exploration. If Bob had been uh, in charge during the International Space Station, he wouldn't have done that. As he said clear, we wouldn't have had the Falcon Heavy or SpaceX. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, the asteroid redirect mission, which was a total nonsense mission conceived of solely for the purpose of providing SLS and Orion something to do, okay, it seemed to be, this is the mission, this is what we are going to do, until Obama lost the election. Because the only support it had was the force of those in power saying, we don't care whether this is rational or not, this is what we are going to do. And, or else they would actually make totally bizarre arguments that it is essential before we go to Mars that we move an asteroid into lunar orbit. Okay. And in fact, we actually had someone say that at our debate on this, uh, on that subject a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the same thing. Now, if you're looking at a possible collapse of the Trump administration, okay, and they leave behind a space program that has no rational support, that its only support was, this is what Donald Trump wanted, you're guaranteed that it will be canceled. We need a rational program. Okay. Question from this side. Um, as I see it, you know, we have one advocate saying, well, let's do all of the above. Let's, let's make that gateway, you know, as some sort of space station just for the, the sake of doing it. Go ahead and build these rockets and, and use them. But on the other hand, Dr. Zubrin's saying that gateway is being made for the purpose of being a kind of toll station on the way to the moon. And so the danger here, as I see it, is what if we really are, as you're saying, locked into to using it that way? Like, like, you know, what you were saying that George Bush number one did for a moon program, but you have to use the space station. So is it really true that you think, you know, that they would make that a condition to, to have to use this gateway. So, you know, just the fact they're calling it a gateway, that's something. Is it true that that would be locking us in? Greg, one 
Sure. And uh, yeah, actually, you've got a good point about the name. And I fought Gerst on the name Gateway. I didn't like it. Uh, it was originally called Deep Space Habitat. And I thought that sounded like something a hamster lived in. Uh, I wanted to call it uh, Deep Space Ship to, uh, to n note the fact that it moves. Um, but the fact is, uh, the space station hasn't been used, as is, is, uh, uh, Bob mentioned, uh, for access to the moon. So no, you're not able to tell people what to do with something in the future. It's not like a contract that you can lock in. I do also want to address the point of giving money to vendors to do projects. That's what we did with, uh, with COTS under, uh, on, under SpaceX. We, we actually created something for vendors to do, and we gave them money for the space station, which is very hard to justify uh, purely on, on uh, its own capabilities and, and delivery. And we got a really great value out of that. We got two separate redundant launch systems and capsules. And just a sec, you can ask a question. And additionally, the airmail program uh, in the in the early 20th century was essentially designed to help develop the commercial aviation industry with a big subsidy by giving these airplane manufacturers and operators something to do. During the 19th century, we did the same thing with the Transcontinental Railroad. It paid off buku for the U.S. Thank you. And okay. Your so, um, look. You have Orion. It weighs 26 tons compared to the Apollo Module 9 or Dragon 10. Dragon is 50% larger than the Apollo capsule. Dragon is absolutely big enough to support human missions. It's 50% larger than the ones we did missions with. And guess what? If you used the lighter Orion, uh, so Dragon instead of Orion, then SLS would be good enough to get it into low lunar orbit with enough propellant for it to come home. Okay? That, I mean, that's not my preferred architecture, but it's a, for someone who believes in Apollo type LOR architectures, that's the obvious fix. Okay, or you could give SLS a proper upper stage, okay, and you wouldn't need it. And you would now have a heavy lift vehicle with a good throw capability that you could use to send heavy payloads to the moon or Mars. But instead of those things, um, we're. Uh, uh, really? One minute. Okay. Fast too, I didn't get to answer Alice. All right, well, there you go. Okay, thank you. I'm interested in the resource utilization on the surface of these uh, bodies. And is there a reason why the uh, processing of the lunar fuel from water would work better on the surface? Because it seems to me that a little bit of gravity would assist in the separation of those gases. Uh, is there any reason to bring it up? Well, yes, it is easier to do it in gravity. It's much easier to develop a system on Earth that would be used in a gravity environment, whether on the moon or Mars, than one in zero G. For instance, the electrol water electrolyzer. But the the um, but the the more important reason actually is that the water is on the moon. Okay, if you have to transport it up to orbit, you're going to use more propellant than the water that you get. Uh, and it's even worse, but the thing on Mars is totally ridiculous. Uh, and uh, to do that, no, if you make the water, uh, the propellant from water on the surface of the moon and use it for ascent, either to orbit or better yet for direct return to Earth, that's a, a pure win. If you have to transport propellant to the moon to get propellant from the moon and move it somewhere else, you're going to lose. Uh, so the moon base should be on the moon. Um, so to be clear, I don't have any problem with using the Dragon. There's nothing I'd love more to, to do than uh, put a deep space rated Dragon with some better power on it on top of a Falcon Heavy and send it to the Gateway and to send things directly to the surface of the moon. So I have no problem with that whatsoever. Oh, and by the way, the, the wet mass of Orion is, is 23,000 pounds, not 26. Wet mass of what? Orion. You said 26, I think. 26 tons. Question over here. So, um, Mr. Autry, it's interesting that you uh, mentioned the Navy. Um, the military has had a long history of this problem with vendor-driven versus mission-driven acquisitions programs. And in, uh, you, you mentioned the F-35, but in the particularly egregious example in the Navy in recent years is the littoral combat ships. We now have two different versions, and by all accounts, anybody who's been on them reports them as being floating death traps, not mission-capable, and maintenance nightmares. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry. So, um, 
what makes you think, I understand that you believe that we can afford a system like this, um, a, a project like the Lunar Gateway, but what makes you think we would, would ever even receive what we purchase and that we would get a good quality product in the end? Yeah, a excellent question. So first of all, it has to do with the motivation of when you choose vendors with the intent of them developing capabilities, what will you do with those capabilities in the future? So in the case of the COTS program, we developed two launch systems that allowed us not only to resupply the station, which was a real need that NASA had, but we specifically also developed a whole new generation of, of rockets that were more efficient and changed the entire launch paradigm and returned the domination of the international commercial launch business to the U.S. In 2012, we had 0% of in the international launch business. Because we subsidized SpaceX, uh, we ended up with 65% of the, the commercial launch uh, business last year. That's all net uh, positive trade flows into the U.S. that benefit U.S. taxpayers, consumers, create thousands of jobs down here. So we didn't create a, a, a crappy, unusable system, and we got back infrastructure that our country can use. So it has to do with, I think, what the intent was. And the military doesn't have the intent of creating useful infrastructure for commercial purposes. Okay. Uh, to be clear, um, I'm not against projects that uh, end up providing uh, money to uh, commercial space launch companies, but I want them to be rational and useful projects. I want a human spaceflight program that accomplishes the maximum it can and therefore it needs to be properly conceived. You know, uh, so we don't simply add on uh, additional pieces of the action for a variety of commercial players to the SLS program in order to have the maximum number of launches so everybody gets a part in the play. The, the idea is to conceive of the program in as efficient means as possible, and guess what? If we only need one Falcon 9 launch to do each lunar mission, instead of three uh, uh, commercial launches and an SLS, it means you get to go to the moon every month instead of once every two or three years. Okay, so efficiency. I'm not a rocket scientist, but that chart seems to be a bit much to me. <laughs> Just a bit much. I, now, I'm a teamster. Maybe that's the problem. I don't think so, though. Now, what I'm wondering is why we have an incredibly good gateway already established to get to the moon, Mars, the solar system, and it's not costing us any money. It's called Earth. And it's served us now quite well for over half a century to get to the moon, to get to Mars, to get to the other planets. Why do we need a gateway to spend billions and billions for for that, whatever the hell that is, <laughs> to go to the moon and Mars when we have our planet here, which is terrific. And if we really needed a, a satellite, or a, 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 not satellite, but a space station as a gateway to the moon, to Mars, we have the space station. Just use that. Or isn't it big enough? <laughs> I don't know. So explain that to me. What's wrong with Earth? It works great. You're not a rocket scientist. So um, anyway, the space station has nothing to do with, with this particular issue. We do agree that it's uh, inefficient, and Bob would not have funded it, and we would not have a uh, Falcon 9 or SpaceX or a Dragon, and we probably wouldn't have a human spaceflight program anymore if we had used this. We must find the most efficient linear program and have the government run it sort of model. Um, as far as the Earth, yes, it's great to go directly from the Earth to the Moon. I completely support that. I also think it's interesting to think about O'Neill-style habitats and other ways for human beings to exist for long durations uh, in space, and we need to start investigating that and understanding it better. That's part of NASA's mission, and Gateway is a perfectly reasonable component of that. Okay, well, first of all, uh, shuttle launches cost as much as Saturn V launches. Shuttle had the same takeoff thrust as a Saturn V. And we could have continued, if we wanted to, with Saturn Vs, and there was an Apollo applications program where they would have uh, modified the LEM to deliver heavier cargoes one way to the moon. And if we hadn't had the shuttle program, we could have had a lunar base, okay? And uh, if we didn't have the space station, we could have had a lunar base. 
Okay, because uh, there was a plan to, uh, you could convert the shuttle into Shuttle C, it was adequate, and you could create lunar missions uh, that way. Um, but instead, what they did was create a station to give the shuttle a place to go to, but, and then to uh, subject astronauts to medical testing to, to see the effects of zero G on, on humans. But I don't think we go to space to see the effects of space on humans. We go to space to go across space to explore and develop the worlds on the other side of space. And that's the space program we should have had, and that's one the one we should have. And to this side. Let's just junk all that Rube Goldberg nonsense up there. Go direct. One piece, uh, one ship to go there and come back. Keep it short and simple. No, Rube, no none of this Rube Goldberg nonsense. I assume everybody knows what a Rube Goldberg machine is. Ridiculously complicated nonsense. No wonder it's costing an arm and a leg. Do you want to answer that? I have no response to that. Okay. All right, I'll just say one thing. Does anyone believe that this is going to work? This is not going to work. It's not a question that it's going to cost more. That is a question. It has to work. It, don't we want to actually get to the moon? Okay, I mean, if, if, if that's what the goal of the program is, you must come up with an architecture that's going to work. And this is just too complicated. You, you ever hear the saying, keep it simple, stupid? That means that if you don't keep it simple, you're stupid, okay? This is really stupid, okay? Sure, and in, in his last statement, Bob clearly uh, reiterated that he would not have funded the space station. He would have done a, a, a Werner von Braun uh, lo a government lunar base, and we would have a government-dominated space program. We would have never developed a commercial space industry. We wouldn't have SpaceX, and because it's what SpaceX demonstrated, we wouldn't have gotten funding for companies like Rocket Lab in relativity space, and, and we'd be living in uh, you know this, this this vision from a Disney documentary in the 1960s. I, I honestly doubt that, but uh, I do think that there are amazingly unusual paths to a better future. And it involves a lot of iterative experimentation, and it involves, because I teach entrepreneurship, the acceptance of possible failures uh, and trying things that everybody doesn't agree with and trying multiple things instead of this one holy friggin' uh, jihad path to, uh, to the truth. Uh, there need to be multiple things attempted because it's quite possible even Bob is wrong sometimes. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm from Canada, and I like very much your idea to build a fuel-producing plant in Saskatchewan. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Zubin already has an experience to build up a chemical reactor in response to similar questions from NASA to split up CO2 and uh, Mars. So would NASA seriously consider actually to finance projects like that? Because you eventually need to test it somewhere but for the moon, right? So probably you can comment on that. I think it's a great idea. I don't know why it hasn't been mentioned. I'd like to hear what Bob has to say, but I would love to see a robotic mission go to North Canada somewhere and extract water from dirty, dirty ice uh, and convert it to, uh, to hydrogen and oxygen and fly back. That would be awesome. Well, what we actually need is um, robotic missions going to the moon or Mars to make propellant there. Okay, and which would both be a demonstration and would be pre-positioning a vital asset on these places. And in response to what Greg said, said if we hadn't built the space station, we couldn't have developed uh, 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 the SpaceX system because we couldn't have given them the contract to deliver things to the space station. If we had developed a lunar base, we can give people contracts to deliver things to the lunar base. The difference is, is the moon is where you actually want to go. So, yes, I'm all for giving these people contracts, and we can do it uh, in delivering payloads to where we actually need them. SpaceX just delivered a, a test, the Space Telescope, into interplanetary space. That was something worth doing. I'm delighted to give SpaceX that contract, okay? The, 
let's do things worth doing and then give people contracts to do them. Okay. <laughs> so we've got, if we wanted to hold it to a half hour of Q&A, we've got maybe one more on this side, or do we want to keep going longer? a bit? Or? Do another 10 minutes? We'll do 10 more minutes and shut it down. Okay, so at 940, it's the end. 10 more minutes. So next question. Okay, so um, sometimes, I, so I'm going to kind of step back to give us a little more context maybe and, and give us a better, you know, so we can discuss things from a, maybe a clearer standpoint. So um, when they came up with the term new space, we had a problem with how, what do we call what we used to do? <laughs> and of course, people wanted to say old space. The best term I heard was heritage space. So um, in heritage space, the Apollo program and, and mm -hmm. such, is, um, as you said, um, uh, Robert, that they're, uh, you have a clear mission. They were mission oriented. We built tools to do it. And then the end result of that is that, like you say, Apollo was built. It was, you know, then everything was scrapped and then the space shuttle and it was scrapped and, and you end up with building tools just for, that are too focused on the end goal. And the transformation that I saw at New Space when it came out was more about building tools so that we could, when we wanted to come up with a mission, start grabbing tools and use them and put them together for each mission so then we could go wherever we wanted and do whatever we wanted. And so um, I do feel like we're at the point where we need to, um, I'd like to see some missions, some uh, mission-oriented work with the tools that we do have. And it does seem to me that this maybe is a little overkill. So um, I don't know, in that framework, um, how would each of you respond to your positions? Um, I'm having a little trouble finding the question there, but I understand the, the, the rhetorical question. Uh, so again, I, I don't support this complex uh, solution with uh, SLS. I, I support having a, a deep space habitat, which is a smaller and simpler space station that is maneuverable. I'd like to see it occupied a lot more. I'd like to see it supported in service by commercial vehicles. Uh, if, 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 if you want to have Bob's uh, version of the gateway, then I agree with Bob. That's not something we want. But again, I also don't believe that having a single, only one true uh, linear programmatic mission is safe. I think we need to have multiple things going on at, uh, at the same time, and that is part of the investigative sort of thing that NASA did when NASA did things really well, particularly when you look on the aviation side. Okay. And then, once again, any space mission can provide business for space contractors, and including for entrepreneurial space contractors. But if you want to do a worthwhile mission, you do a worthwhile mission, and then you pay the contractors to support that mission. You don't dream up worthless projects like the asteroid redirect mission or the lunar orbit toll booth just to give people money. Do worthwhile missions and give people money to do worthwhile missions. It's that simple. Hey, Bob, would you ever consider uh, doing a moon direct to the pole of the moon? Uh, yes, that's exactly what I propose. Uh, the pole of the moon is where uh, the water is to be found. And uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I think what you want to do is establish a base at the pole of the moon you can make propellant there. It can be used to allow you to both fly back to Earth. It can also be used to power rocket-powered flight vehicles that are yet allow you to travel around the moon point to point and come back to the base. That's the value of the base. The moon's a big place. It has a surface equal to the uh, continent of Africa. You're not going to explore it by driving. You have to fly. Where are you going to get the propellant? You've got to get that propellant from the moon. So you want to build a base on the surface of the moon, in the, which is most rich in the materials needed to make propellant. That's where the base needs to be. So it's just a question of being rational about how, how you develop the moon. And uh, as opposed to putting a miscellaneous project, which does not contribute to uh, lunar resource utilization or, or, or anything. Time. Now we've got time for one more here. Wait, and then, I didn't get a response to that oh, question. You, sorry. 
Real quick. Uh, so actually, I'd like to use my response to ask what Allison was going to ask me when she interrupted uh, my previous statement. I didn't have time. Well, I, I have a question now to what uh, Bob just said. Wait, wait, I don't know if you can cut the line there. I was just trying to give you. <laughs> <laughs> give me some time. Uh, I, I had a question for, for Bob. If if we did not have to go to the moon and the goal was to go to Mars, I'm interested in knowing if you think it's uh, economical for us to stop at the moon, to go on to Mars, or is there any other advantage of going to the moon if the mission, if the purpose was to go to Mars? Uh, no. Um, the, uh, if you want to go to Mars, you go to Mars. Uh, the, the delta V to go from low Earth orbit to low lunar orbit is the same as to go from low Earth orbit to trans-Mars injection. Okay, so even if you had propellant ready for you in low lunar orbit to refuel to go to the moon, it wouldn't make sense to get there. And it's even worse if you're talking about going to the surface of the moon to get propellant. So that, that makes no sense. The purpose of going to the moon is to go to the moon. Okay, the, the, and it needs to be justified on those terms. Uh, and for people to say to me, you can't go to Mars until you go to the moon, uh, is basically saying you can't do your program until you do my program. I think we can do both, okay? But I want an efficient lunar architecture, which is the best one for the moon, it gives you the most access to the moon, and frees up your assets so you can also go to Mars. Thanks, I didn't get to answer your question. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely agree. The, the, the poles of the moon are what everybody thinks is interesting right now for the water ice reasons, uh, for power reasons, and for the fact that, uh, at least in the South Pole, it looks like there might be the core of a large asteroid there. One of the interesting things about the moon and, and asteroids is that there might be a lot of uh, asteroids there uh, slightly below the surface in the bottom of those craters. We need to do some uh, radar mapping to, uh, to determine that. There are people who think that they would have been vaporized, but uh, I think there's some good reasons to believe that they're still there. So, yeah, you're absolutely right on. And importantly, our international competitors, most notably the Chinese, are very aware of this and intend to grab those areas and, and would probably call them operational exclusion zones, preventing us from getting there if we don't get there in a timely manner. Back to this side. All right, very interesting conversations. Love all your comments. One of the things that I never understood about the SLS was this need to build a whole new rocket, three and a half billion dollars for 10 years just to go bigger when we have developed years of assembling things and building things in space. I think what you're forgetting here, Greg, there's a lot of opportunity here in having multiple providers, low, high, um, low, uh, being able to accept low reliability missions and lower costs in order to do this. Maybe you could talk about some of the advantages of the Gateway program because there were many that were there and reasons that motivated this development. Um, so I'm not sure where you're going with the SLS, but again, I don't necessarily support uh, that architecture. It was supposed to be incredibly simple. We were going to take leftover shuttle parts. I mean, the RS-25 engines they're using are actually supposedly leftover from orbiters, right? And then we were going to use boosters that were essentially the same, a little bigger, uh, from, from, from the shuttle program and uh, put a simple capsule on top and it was going to be simple, but you know, somehow we made that not very simple. Uh, as far as the gateway is concerned, again, what I think is really interesting is the good thing about the uh, asteroid redirect mission was that the people in NASA knew that they weren't ever going to get an asteroid, but they spent the money on the solar uh, electric propulsion system. I think it's interesting. I think it deserves more applications and testing. I think it's great to have a, a, a movable station like Habitat uh, that is cheaper and simpler. Okay, uh, I would just like to point out one thing, that the Gateway Project was conceived of while Charles Bolden was NASA Administrator, and his position was we should not go to the moon, okay, and that we will never go to the moon, you know, over my dead body, okay, and thus he supported the Gateway. So if you want to go to the moon, you might suspect that this is not a plan to go to the moon. It is a plan not to go to the moon. Okay, and we're already getting, the Mars people are getting blamed for this thing. But no, this is not a plan to go to Mars either. Um, the, 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 it is just a plan to have something to do. 
Okay. Uh, to be clear, uh, you know, Charlie was gone uh, before Gerst came and, and proposed that the uh, the moribund uh, habitat be redeployed as a, a lunar gateway. So that really happened uh, uh, not under uh, uh, Bolden, but under Lightfoot. Um, and uh, anyway, just a point of fact. Well, that is the full 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. And by the way, I forgot to say this, but I want to say it now. I want to thank uh, Greg for making this conference possible. And thank you, Bob. It was a, a great talk, and everybody uh, continue the debate, please.